Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. So you are not able to open the presentation of John Kempen? No, sir. No yet. We no. require permission, sir. Well, that's all too late. You know, this comes far, far, far too late. He has sent it out yesterday. He's still sleeping. He's in the United States. So this is, let's call it sad, but it's not your fault. He had to come over with that one, definitely one or two days before. This is very difficult now. I don't know how to do it. Um, so I'm waiting now for the other ones. That's let me check.
Hi Manfred. Oh, he's not there yet. Ah, oh, I'm there, there. Of course. Of course. Hi Manfred. Hi. So let me see where we are here. Hi. You can't see me? I can see you, yeah. You can see me, yeah, that's fine, yeah. You know, Mark. Manfred, as I was preparing this, I was thinking this might be a nice small article for uh, IOIS. I mean, for OII. You know, um, um, I didn't find very much in the literature, certainly not in uveitis, about transition from academic to private practice and potentially back. It would be an interesting article to put together. Even that whole series now would be nice in terms of articles. Definitely. But actually, yesterday, there was only Zumiava Basu with me. And we definitely found out that there was some, hmm, let's call it basic misunderstanding. We, we hardly will talk about how to start from the beginning to build up a uveitis clinic. I think that's all step by step by step, the, yeah, the upper steps. So very yep. similar with me. So let me probably in the panel, we have hopefully 20 minutes. Let me try to put in a, a system, something like what is necessary for this one. You need some uh, ideas how you want to do that. You need some good education. And we are talking a lot of education. I at least me exclusively uh, for education. And then you need some kind of plan. That plan means you have to probably start with a clinic once a week a day, something like that one. You have to discuss that with your bosses, something like that, that you have really some uh, big shoulders to develop some big shoulders for these things. You should try to recruit co-workers as soon as possible, because if this really increases, you need some people to replace you too. And then you need contacts. And contacts are pediatrics, pulmonologists, infectiologists, something like that. From that point, it would be very, very good when we could develop this system, because I think this is something uh, people had asked to bring in in such a uh, in such a webinar. Um, Sumyazu, I mentioned that to him, and he will try to bring that also into his presentation a little bit more. So we can probably pick up things from his presentations already and then see what's happening. But we have to conclude things like that one. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, some of it I do mention because it all also has a, a bearing on whether you switch from academia to a private practice. And I wanted to add a specific slide on uveitis because one of the biggest challenges is what you just said is contact to other specialties and Absolutely. in particular also access to lab. Yes. So let's see where we are standing then. The problem number one is that John Kemp has sent his presentation and we cannot open it. Oh, I didn't yeah, send well, mine yet. But I, I, can I do it online? Otherwise, I'll send it to you. No, not to me, please, to global. No, no, no. Send global, everything yeah. to global. Everything to global, yes. And uh, Stephen J, I think he ascended to, and they were open, yeah, he's able online to open now. this one. He's op online? Yep. Good, good morning, Manfred. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Ariel. Or good, af uh, good afternoon, I guess. Hi, Stephen. For us, nice it's good you. afternoon, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to see everyone. Hi, Sumya. Hi. Very Hello, good. This uh, and... Uh, see uh, we have connected before. Zumia, do you think you can you switch to a microphone? Uh, my microphone is on, but am I not audible? It's, is it the Zoom? quality is actually it's more some, something like a room sound. Oh, OK. So microphone may be a little bit better, definitely. Is it better now? Oh, much better. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Hardly to compare. <laughs> have you been able to add a few of these points we discussed yesterday? Yes, yes, I have added. Perfect, perfect. So, Stephen, quickly, um, I think the idea came from someone 
from the mem from the participants some uh, months ago, and I think it's a very very good one, definitely. But uh, you, when I see all these presentations, we probably concentrated a lot for the last steps to become really super experts, something like that one. And something I would like to discuss at the end, the panel, we have 20 minutes for that one, is how to build up these things mm -hmm. from the beginning. You need some interest, yes? Without interest in such frustrating things like uveitis, you die on the first day, yes? There's no idea. Um, you need education. We talk a lot about education from a different uh, perspective. I think that's fine. And you need some kind of plan. So my plan, for example, would be, for example, to start one day a week uh, with the support of your bosses, something like this. You know, these are typically not world leading persons starting with uveitis. These are interested young persons with a lot of engagement and encouragement. And I think they should need the power of their bosses a little bit, the background of this one. They need some good co-workers step by step, not immediately. And then also they need some context like pediatrics, pulmonologists, infectiologists. I think the need for this one will be very clear with your presentation too. So probably when we can add, or if you can add then your information, your suggestions in the last part in the panel, um, that would be really great. Yeah, to make yeah, it more that, practical. That sounds, that sounds terrific. Yeah, like what are the practical things as a as a learner yes. at different stages to absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know the the re, it's I think even worse than cataract surgery. There's a lot of frustration if you handle such patients. If you see really severe cases of uveitis, and then you end up with telling everyone, oh, you start now a special clinic, yeah? And then you get really the weird cases you can imagine. And that hits you for some time. And for that, you need some building up situation. Yeah, certainly it really starts with the foundation and fundamentals. Uh, and then as you kind of hone down, whether it's, you know, non-infectious, you know, treatments and all the great things that you guys are talking about or infectious disease, um, you're right. I think that the tendency, um, you know, myself included, I think for all of us, yes, again, when we're super specialized is to kind of live in a very super specialized yeah. world. Well, I think I mentioned already, we would love to see you as a member of the ISG, Stephen. Oh, I'd love to participate however I could contribute. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a privilege. There was a very clear history. role yeah. for you already, and probably we can discuss that by telephone or something like that, we just, we developed now the ambassador system of the ISG so mm -hmm. that ISG members are in charge for some parts of the world of countries which are not ISG members, which do not have ISG members. And I'm still looking urgently for someone from West Africa. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we have a lot, of, a lot of partners. And, you know, interestingly, there's a lot, been a lot of focus, I think, um, and then Manfred, you had some connection to West Africa through some colleagues as yes, well, right? Sierra yeah. Leone. Sierra Leone this right. is, you know, this is a wonderful guy. He's perfect. He was educated in the one of the Venice causes, but again, he is not a super expert and not yet an ISG member. Yeah. To make him an ISG member, to make people from different countries which have no ISG members to ISG mm -hmm. members is one of the roles of an ambassador of such countries. Yeah, to improve the situation in such countries. So probably uh, at the end of my talk, I will talk about this idea and uh, you will see how urgently we would need you for West Africa. That would be really fantastic, yes. John yeah, Kempen yeah. is covering more or less East Africa. We have North Africa with Monsef. We have Derek Smith, Smith uh, from South Africa coming up, but West Africa is really missing. Let's talk about this one probably when you saw my presentation this will be the end of my presentation then okay great yeah yeah that would be really fantastic yeah. and then the other thing I, I would just mention uh, very briefly manfred is that we have some number of partners in dr congo with uh fairly strong um um i mean infrastructure relative to some other places in in west africa too and so there could be yeah. some partnerships and links that we've we've recently Sounds um, very good uh, yeah so we also have some, a lady, I think she will be, you know, I, I always see the people who are participating here 
in the she's a list of participants of uh, listeners and she's always there she's the only person from congo she's a toxoplasmosis person and she's really very very close to us uh, with alejandra de la torre to colombia to co-work and i think such people to incorporate these people into such a group of isg would be absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. Even if they are not able to have published, let's say, 10 million uh, manuscripts, which is difficult for these people, you know, very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think we still have a few minutes, six minutes. That's fine. Unfortunately, I think John... Uh, uh, John has not... We were not able to see all. Oh, yes. Did you try your presentations, please? Yeah, uh, I did. Uh, I can share it once more just for the sake of it. Sumya, yours worked. Yeah, yeah mine actually but did not work yesterday. So. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You did it? So no? Perfect. It's working now, right? I mean. Wonderful. Okay, the next yeah, one, yeah. Mark or Stephen? Well, well, Stephen or first, was, maybe. Yeah, was somebody going to present it from their their deck, or was it going to come from my computer? I guess. Well, I can share my screen, and you can tell me if you're able to see it. Yeah. Perfect. What do you see now? One, one or two slides. Lake Geneva, two slides. Would ah, be better okay, one so slide. I need to make a switch somewhere, but uh, that I have to try and arrange. That's not Geneva. That's the uh, um, um, Lake of Neuchâtel. It's a different lake. Mm. Um, they all look so beautiful. Stephen, can you yes, share I this know. also with us? Oh, so my, I'm, I apologize, Manfred. Was uh, I thought that somebody from the um, global conference okay. was going to play the video? Yes. Global, can you please try? I think we've seen Stephen's one already. You should have it. Okay, sir. Here we go. Yes. Stephen, is there any video in? And uh, there is no video in this this per Perfect. Se. Mark, yeah. same to you. Is no there video. a video in? No. Yes? No video. No. So that sounds so perfect. Let me, just, let me just try once more. You tell me what you're able to see this. Okay, so this should be screen number one, which is fine. And then now you should just see one second. You should just see one slide, right? Oh no, it's still two. Shit. Okay, how do I switch that? Okay, let me see. Hmm. Emergency. Yep. Well, that's Stephen's once. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again to Dr. Zerhut, Dr. Gupta, and Can the IUSG. Can you please stop this in the moment? You want to start already, or what is it? To global? Global? Yes, you want to start, or what? You have three minutes left. No, that's three minutes left, yeah. So Stephen's is working. That's fine. Let's concentrate for Mark's presentation. Yeah, one second. I'm just switching something that should make it now work better. And we're going to go back to this now. So if I share screen, this is now screen number one. Perfect. And uh, now if I'm going to use this, mm. you're seeing one or two. Do you see one or two slides now? We don't see anything. We see two we slides. See two slides. Yeah. Still, shit. Okay. Let me get rid of this. I don't know how this problem started, but I think I have a solution. Save. And then go here. Otherwise, I sent you the presentation in uh, PowerPoint, so we could always use the PowerPoint presentation and see how it uh, how it looks. 
But so then we should start I... with Sumya's presentation. Would that be okay, Sumya? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Two more minutes to go. So I'm going to allow the attendees to join, please. Sorry? I'm going to allow the attendees, sir. Yeah, that's fine. So can we just try one last time because now I can't share. Okay, yes, please, sir. Shum, you are, can you leave? Share right now. Can you leave the oh, presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. yeah. No, you should be able to see. Okay, so now I'm starting the video. Yeah. And make it large. Yeah. Perfect. That's good. Yeah. What do you see now? One I or think two? You... One slide. One. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. So, Mark, leave it as it is. I only make a short introduction and okay. uh, then people, yeah, then you can start. So, let's wait for a few seconds more. Mm -hmm. Just filling up with participants, so let's wait, let's Good. say, a minute. So welcome, dear participants of the webinar number 13 of the ISG. This time we have the topic of how to start a uveitis clinic, something which was suggested from one of the participants. We take that topic very, very honest. I think it's very important to uh, increase the awareness of uveitis, to increase the numbers of experts and um, if you are missing in the beginning something from the basis, we will try to summarize that in the panel, which is on number six here, the last 20 minutes. Um, I think you know how the system works. Uh, if you want to get a, a CME point, you will receive a, um, a questionnaire at the end and to send that back will allow you to get all the documents and CME reports which you need. Okay, please only use the uh, question and answer points here, not the chat. Uh, we will not answer anything in the chat. This is actually on the, for the faculty, but uh, question and answers, we are happy to answer these things even after the meeting in case we do not have too much time. So please enjoy this course and we will start with Mark Desmet who talks about from university to private practice, which is in Switzerland. So thank you very much, Manfred. And uh, this is maybe in some ways an introduction to the topic. Um, it'll cover uh, more general aspects and a little bit about uveitis itself. Um, uh, for those who don't know me, I uh, started my career in ophthalmology, well, before ophthalmology in Canada. I spent uh, nearly nine years at the NIH where I uh, uh, did a, my fellowship and was on staff and also um, uh, then did a fellowship in vitro retinal surgery. I headed a department in the Netherlands for 10 years in Amsterdam and then switched uh, to part-time private practice. So I'd like to consider that uh, switch so that people uh, early in their career or later may consider it and then some specific aspects with regards to uveitis. Why do we choose academics? Well, for one, it's a more exciting patient uh, care, more complex patients. Usually you can take time to really try to solve and see the end result, particularly in complex cases. You get to do research, uh, teaching and mentorship are important aspects and usually one of the reasons why people want to stay in academics. And there is, for those who start, really um, continuity and safety. Since you're coming out of a residency, 
it's essentially a continuation of what you've done, but you're assuming a, another level of rule, which is more or less based on what you've learned from your mentors. And maybe a very important aspect is that there is a minimal administrative hassle, which in fact, if you go into private practice, you have to assume if you do it on your own or certainly is taken care of by the situation in which you go. <clears throat> Making the choice out of your residency the ones who end up in academics usually either are able with their mentors and their support, the university potentially or the department to get some grants for research early on. They tend to have published a bit more papers during their residency and spent more time trying to do some research while those who go into non-academics right away have spent less time trying to acquire these skills which are very useful once you go out. But the difference is not necessarily all that great. The biggest difference comes in more in terms of the time spent doing research and the time spent uh, having publications. However, with regards to life choices, the number of children, your happiness, um, the type of uh, career that you uh, take, they're very much similar in both sides. What's interesting is that at least for um, these publications in surgery, Sorry, uh, in terms uh, of recommending, Sorry? So, uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, actually, we are unable to uh, see your screen, shared screen. It's not shared. You can't right see now. my shared screen. No. That's a problem. Yes. Can you please share it again? I have to quit this and share it again. Uh, let me see. Yes, now it is visible, sir. Can you see it now? Yeah. Sorry, one slide or two. Uh, one slide. It is weird to start. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll go from here, and essentially, it doesn't show much change. As I said, if we look at happiness factors, uh, they're about the same in all of them. It's interesting that academics tend to recommend a surgical career, ophthalmology, more than people in private practice, and uh, we could always discuss that another time. Having completed a fellowship, obviously, for UVitis is a given. Um, as, uh, what happens is that over time, you find that people that have been in practice for 10 or more years, that's when very often a switch towards pri private practice is being considered, and while um, other factors are, are less important. What, is if, what happens if you want to go and become a professor later on? Does the fact that you've gone to private practice cause a problem? Not necessarily. Um, if you want to become an associate assistant professor, having seven to ten years of uh, practice in the periphery might be useful. Getting to a full professorship is very rare if you've come out of private practice. It is possible if you have a very, very um, specific expertise that has been gained over years. And then usually you have over 20 years of experience, uh, either in industry, in practice or in other settings. I think the pressures of, um, of, let's say, academic life are well known to everybody. Um, there is usually less patients that are being seen, particularly in ophthalmology, or one to, uh, one to two mix. There's a lot more non-clinical work required. It's about a five to one split so that, and <clears throat> most people complain not about the teaching, research and writing, but administration. And I can tell you that when I became a chair, that was probably the most difficult part is the administration bureaucracy and in particular, the lack of support to be able to cover all of these and be able to continue with teaching and research. And, and that's what pushed me a little bit towards coming back to my areas of, uh, let's say, um, um, interest, which was the clinical side of things um, and the research and had to give up to some extent teaching, although I do it through this and other means. Um, what about private practice? There are things, of course, that are uh, also specific to this, and this is risk management. We have um, a lot of different types of risk, and I'll just look at two of them, one of which is um, the business uh, risk management. So you have to look at, uh, in your own practice, whether there are certain weaknesses, there can be threats from others, or there may be opportunities. Um, with regards to what I do, I'm a vitreoretinal surgeon and uveitis expert. There was already some uh, uveitis expertise out in the periphery where I came here in Switzerland, but no uh, private uh, uh, vitreoretinal surgery, although that very quickly uh, developed <clears throat> after I started the first such clinic in Lausanne where I'm based. 
There are financial risks you need to assume, high capital investments, there is uncertainty in reimbursement, particularly today, and that is overall in the world where there is more and more pressure on reducing costs. And so you have to make sure that you're not aiming too big and that it is realistic. The stated reasons for leaving include income disparity, excess administration I've already managed, uh, mentioned, lack of support, um, the lack of protective academic time, and for many people who do more clinical and teaching uh, work than research, uh, very often in universities it isn't quite as um, uh, valued, and you can see the reasons that have been stated here um, on the uh, graph. So what happens? Why would you transition? Well, you have to know, uh, you have to ask questions yourself. You have to know yourself and know what you're looking for short and long term. Do you want to get into private practice and stay there? Is it because of certain aspects of the academic world that you don't like and you want some exper experience in the periphery and be able to come back? And the balance between the two is very nicely outlined in this article that is uh, indicated here uh, from the World Wide Web. It does give you more autonomy, so you're able to choose the setup that you want. And I ended up uh, getting a, private, a practice where I work two and a half to three days a week. And the rest of the time I do consulting and I continue doing research with a number of people around the world. There's more continuity of care, um, and this is maybe more so outside of uveitis, but you're going to follow your patients more, so you'll be better able to know what the ultimate outcome is two, three, four, ten years down the road and you have flexible scheduling much better than you can in an academic world. Research and innovation is possible in private practice. Uh, it's going to be more patient resource based. It'll depend on the number of patients you have. You can certainly participate in clinical trials if you have access to given patients. You can participate in advisory boards in, uh, in societies like the IUSG. You can also do uh, uh, research for the industry. In regards to teaching, as long as you keep some kind of uh, um, alignment with the university, preferably uh, close to where you trained, as part-time faculty, you can have fellows and students, you'll take part in seminars and webinars, um, and uh, innovation as such can happen everywhere, whether it's academic or private practice. With a private practice, though, you're going to have to do extra work. You'll have to reach out to the community, do some educational programs to teach um, uh, people that are out in the community, um, uh, uh, both patients as well as physicians, uh, what you're offering and make sure that you maintain these contacts. You may have to uh, do more dinners where you go to uh, clubs, social clubs in the area where you, uh, you live or local societies so that they're aware of uh, your expertise and make use of it and not just refer, for example, to a university which may be far away. And today I would say you need to develop a presence both on websites as well as in social media. Now there are of course other uh, means of uh, developing yourself beyond uh, the academic world. You can do consulting in industry that is based on your past experience and expertise, for example, in that you've acquired in the university in setting up clinical studies, in developing new programs with new medications or, uh, or, or uh, equipment. You can also participate in program developments for different types of organizations, uh, be part of a startup, or as you'll hear later, also try to develop a teaching program for the third world. When is a good time to transition? Well, you're the only one who knows, and maybe God, and uh, it's based on your ambition and personal choices. Um, my general recommendation would be to, to do it as late as possible, acquire as much in, as knowledge and expertise as you can uh, in an academic center, both in um, setting up studies, participating in, in uh, research, but also in gaining clinical experience so that you're more and more independent uh, over time when you go out into, the, into practice. It's not a one-way street. There's always the possibility of coming back. And what you learn in the periphery is quite different from what you might have in an academic setting. And I think equally uh, uh, valuable. You do need an adequate technical platform, sufficient training and patient access. But if you have these, today, at least in ophthalmology, private practice is essentially the same as academics. And in fact, in the US, they faced this in the 90s, where it was very hard to retain people in academic centers because with a good setup, we can do virtually everything in the periphery. 
So what kind of practice would you choose? Solo practice was the traditional way. It does present more risk um, in some ways because you're on your own, less contact with, uh, with other physicians. And in uveitis, that's particularly important. We need contacts with other specialists and that's much easier to do either in a uh, academic setting or otherwise if you're in a large community uh, hospital where you do have all specialties that are present. Group practice, of course, gives you more the opportunity to interact with other subspecialties. Even within ophthalmology, we need people that know about glaucoma, about anterior segment and cornea and, uh, and retina. So having uh, access to these other people can be very useful. And group practice obviously allows you to cross uh, consult with, uh, with people that get to know uh, better your patients as well as your expectations. Private clinics can also be a solution, uh, particularly if they're large enough and cover most of ophthalmology. But very often private clinics are very close to equity investors. And what they do is they buy large practices and clinics. They expect to be able to get money back from it. And so they'll dissuade you in some ways of trying to treat the most complex patients unless they're going to involve surgery. So it's very important that you look at the exact uh, setup where you're coming in, the local environment, and that is, to some extent, the community support you can expect from the city, the local government, the presence of colleagues and uh, university support. If you're leaving the university, it's good that your chairman, the people that are there, you can still consult, even if you're going to be uh, several uh, hundreds of kilometers away, because you may want to refer patients back to them and get patients from them referred to you. Patient access obviously is important, and if you're selecting a particular place to set up an office, look at the density of specialists in that specific, uh, specific area, particularly ones that have expertise similar to yours. And of course, be very, very uh, careful with regards to your own expectations. Nothing is set in stone, and uh, you could evolve, for example, from a group practice or community care hospital to a more solo practice later on realizing that for solo practice, you still need to have a place where you can do surgery. And um, while in the US, it may be easy with people that do, uh, let's say, anterior segment surgery to have a surgery center for retina, it becomes a lot more complicated. But with a group practice, of course, that's a possibility. What should you look for if you're going to join a practice or what are you going to need to acquire? Well, for one thing, in a private practice, you need uh, to uh, manage the uh, human resources, your secretaries, your technicians, and that demands a certain degree of expertise. Billing, you have to do on your own. It's not the university doing for it, you for it. You have to be able to recruit your patients and make sure that uh, both patients, physicians, and specialists know that you exist and you have to be able to keep up to date. And so I've taken this out of this article and they say, yeah, particularly in the beginning, you're going to have to be your own business uh, manager. You'll have to know something about billing and coding and bookkeeping, human resources, become the chief executive officer, etc. These are all true. Of course, if you do it with more than one individual, you can, you can share the tasks, but of course, one person has to lead. And I think the most important advice that can be given here is you should get professional advice outside of what we've learned as physicians uh, and as uh, on our career to become a specialist, because these are things that we don't necessarily learn unless you're confronted with it, for example, in part being a head of a department. There are courses available through, for example, the American Academy of Ophthalmology and others and in each country, there are associations that can give you the uh, important information and provide you uh, the adequate help to carry this out. Now, it's also important to realize that if you're going to join a practice or start a practice, you're bringing something unique and um, you're going to reinforce a practi uh, practice or you're going uh, by being an extra hand or you're going to provide a new resource. Most likely you're going to be the first person who comes with uveitis expertise in this particular practice. And you're probably also a subspecialist in another area. So this is very important, both the subspecialties you have, whether you have experience in clinical trials, if you've been able to run in the past uh, 
uh, research, clinical or basic, and you have this mindset to be able to develop new things, these are skills that you'll be able to bring. And so you need to know the skills that you'll bring. And the other important aspect is that each physician that joins a practice brings a network of contacts and uh, one should not underestimate what that can represent for a, uh, a starting or existing practice. Pay is not the most important factor. It's in fact how the clinic is being run, how the people look at uh, setting up the practice and the type of care they're uh, wanting to, uh, to uh, give to their patients. And I think that's where you should focus your attention on when you're trying to select either the model or the location or the group of people you're going to join. What should you expect? Um, uh, most articles that I've looked at and in speaking to people, they all say, well, the reason for private practice is because you make more money. And this is true over time. If you look at many articles, they'll say that the break-even point between being in private practice or, uh, and leaving academics is somewhere between three and five years. By break-even, it means that after this time, you'll be earning more than you would have had you stayed in academics. But in those first few years, you can in fact be at a, a, a high financial risk. You might even go broke. If you opened the practice just before COVID, it would have been very difficult. And so it's important to realize some of these uh, other aspects of going out. You earn more, but your overhead expenses are higher. Ideally for ophthalmology, they should be about 30%, but they can easily be 40 or 50. We have a high capital investment. You know, you need OCTs. We need uh, uh, all kinds of slit lamps and many other machines that are required in order to do decent investigations. And these have to come out from your investment. You also need sufficient uh, support staff and uh, in looking around, particularly in North America, in busy practices where some retina experts see 100 patients a day, they have in fact one ophthalmic assistant for each 10 patients seen in a given day. So that's a lot of, uh, of support staff that is required and the need for a personnel manager. You should have cross-trained uh, personnel that makes it a lot easier. And I think having part-time people also gives you more flexibility because very often these people can be set in if somebody falls ill, develops COVID or something else. What about uveitis? Well, expertise is obviously important. The more experience you have, the easier it will be to carry out uh, in private practice your specialty. You need uh, a sufficient access to patients so that you can also stay up to date with new developments. I've already mentioned the importance of equipment. What's also important is having a good base of consultants in other disciplines, people that understand what you're doing and what you require. And it goes from pediatricians to rheumatologists to immunologists. And to give you an example, I worked for a small period of time in Belgium and the rheumatologist there, when it came to treating children with methotrexate, never wanted to give the dose that was really required because in his eyes, there was no uh, systemic disease. So why give a high enough dose that potentially could have some degree of toxicity? And so some of these patients had ongoing uh, inflammation when using methotrexate and I had to switch to another drug. You also need a good reference laboratory. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate here in Switzerland that there is a lab that sends around um, uh, small cars that pick up uh, blood samples and they can do virtually any blood sample that is required. Not so much when we're looking at anterior chamber analysis, but I can draw the blood and get the results instead of having to depend on other people. And I think it's important also to participate in regional and national UVI specialty groups because they'll tell you about what's going on locally, how to set things up and what more or less the local standards are. And finally, if you're going to transition, I think there are, these are important points to consider. There is always a fear to go uh, from academics to private practice. Hopefully I've been able to get rid of this and also uh, tell you that you can go back if you want. You'll definitely depend on the support from your spouse, uh, friends and families and colleagues and mentors. There is no perfect fit. Um, it's a journey and it will have to adapt as if it would if you're staying in academics. Start small, not too big because otherwise uh, it may financially not be viable. Invest and foster in your team. Be patient and be realistic. It takes time. Expect some setbacks. Everybody gets them as you're starting to set up a practice. 
and you're going to start, uh, you should uh, chart your own course, do it, and notice that it's going to, as long as you keep in motion and keep moving, things will always work out. This is a reality of life for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Very nice. Um, I think we will cover some of these single uh, ideas again during the other talks and would like to have Sumyava Basu now to talk about from the academic EVITIS in a high volume setting in India. Sumya? Yeah. Uh, is my slide visible? Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. And uh, it's wonderful that IUSG has chosen this topic for discussion. Thankful to uh, Professor Zirut for uh, considering me for this talk on academic uveitis in a high volume setting. Now, when I think of these words, academic uveitis and a high volume setting, the most direct example that comes to my mind is that of the story of the trematode-induced uveitis. Now, this story is from Aravindai Hospital in Madurai in South India, for those of you who are not aware. And it started with the observation of these conglomerate anterior chamber granuloma. Now, this was noted by Professor Ratnam, whose picture here is from the early days of her career. And she found that unlike other granuloma in TB endemic countries where they're often treated with anti-TB drugs, these were not responding to the anti-TB drugs or to corticosteroids. She looked at the cases over the past six years and there were more than 200 such cases uh, of pediatric uveitis where the granuloma did not respond to treatment and the eyes went to thysis. And in fact, she found that 40 boys of these 200 uh, kids were from one single village. Then she followed them up and found that all these kids were bathing in one pond. And when she did a histopathological evaluation of these granuloma, it was found that this trematode was, which is called as prosivorum varium, was lying within this granuloma. Thereafter, of course, it's a long story which has stretched over more than two decades now. And it was found that this trematode uh, is found inside these snails, which are the first intermediate hosts. And there are fish which eat these snails and birds which eat the fish, which are actually the definitive host for these trematodes. Now, all, these, uh, all this research had a huge impact on this particular form of uveitis. This was reported from several other locations, both in India and in other parts of the world. A molecular diagnosis for this trematode-induced uveitis was found by quantitative PCR. And because of this accurate diagnosis, it was possible to avoid unnecessary anti-TB treatment in these kids. Most importantly, the, they found a way to prevent such kind of intraocular inflammation by advising the villagers to avoid these contaminated ponds or to clean the ponds in their localities. Such a huge impact from the research which originated in the clinic. So what are the lessons that we learn here? The first lesson is that there are tremendous opportunities in high volume settings. The more you see, the more you ask. The second thing is that these are our problems. Nobody is going to look into these problems for us. So it's up to us to find solutions for these problems. And once you have found a solution, the impact is very immediate. Now, for the purpose of this talk, I spoke to three individuals from India, Prasad Mod Gupta, Dr. Jyotirmay Biswas, and Dr. Ratinam, about their views on academic uveitis in uh, these high volume settings, because all three of these individuals have excelled in this kind of a scenario. So what is academic medicine? Academic medicine 
the essence lies in thinking more about the work that you're doing this enhanced thinking leads to teaching learning and further studies innovation research and discoveries which ultimately lead to an improvement in the healthcare the ultimate goal can be found in the statement that it lies in the development of basic principles effective policies and the best practices in healthcare and what is high volume now when we talk of high volume it can be considered in two ways one is the general patient volume in the clinic and the other is the disease or procedure specific volume now the disease or procedure specific volume could depend on the prevalence of the disease it could depend on the specialty of a particular clinician or the pioneering work done by that person and is not always associated with overall high volumes in the clinic on the other hand high overall patient volumes which is the context of this presentation is generally found in tertiary care centers or multi disciplinary hospitals they usually but not always located in the major cities and have a component of medical education undergraduate and above and may or may not incorporate research policy and planning now what are the opportunities for research in such high volume settings now research here is driven by the type of patients that are coming here you see problems you identify the problems in your patient population and you try to uh, find solutions for them it's a good escape from the mundane repetitive tasks that we uh, tend to do in such high volume settings and it's a good vent for the curious mind that many of us may have once you have started your research the speed is also very high because the patient volumes are very high to conduct that kind of research and the application is very immediate we found the example in the case of trematode induced uveitis so it starts from the bedside goes to the bench and again comes back to the bedside now besides research like i mentioned on the slide on academic uv on academic medicine there is also scope for education and because the clinical material is so exhaustive you have a good scope for bedside teaching of both a large variety and a large complexity of cases in your clinic there is also a good scope for multidisciplinary approach not only amongst different ophthalmic subspecialties but also a large number of non ophthalmic specialties depending on the kind of setup you are and ultimately education leads to more research questions and once you find solutions through those research that feeds the education again so this becomes like a positive cycle here there is also a good scope for health policy and planning but we are not going to that discussion today in this session now why what stops us from carrying out academic uh, uveitis in our high volume settings usually people would put the blame on uh, the clinical overload the large number of patients time constraints the uh, difficulty in carrying out all investigations or the incomplete documentation but that is not the truth the truth the real culprits lie in our failure to question what we cannot explain by our understanding of the subject and also our tendency to accept the norm or what we have read in the textbooks or in uh, published literature so here is a great example uh, from the pgi chandigarh and this information i got through direct uh, discussion with professor amod gupta so the story of subpigenous lycoroiditis i think all of us who are attending this uh, session today are familiar with the tubercular uh, origin of subpigenous lycoroiditis now now if you look into the entire story that probably started somewhere in the late 80s it's a story of meticulous documentation very keen observation and 
a collaboration with internists and other uh, physicians. Now, this group published two important papers, which were, of course, followed up by a large number of other papers from their own centers and other centers across the world. The first paper was published in 2002, and it was only called at as serpiginous choroidopathy in North India. At that point of time, the authors did not have much clue about the link with tuberculosis. The main thing that they found here was that this serpiginous choroidopathy was not fitting into the literature that was available on serpiginous choroiditis from the Western world. And it was also not fitting into the literature on AMPI, which was available from the Western world. Again, these patients were younger. They usually had unilateral disease, unlike the previously reported serpiginous choroiditis or AMPI. The disease was multifocal, and the serpiginous type pattern tend to progress in a wave-like uh, pattern. They, based on their understanding at that point of time, treated all these patients with uh, corticosteroids and or cyclophosphamide. And most of these lesions actually resolved. And although many of them came back with recurrence as well. Interestingly, in this paper, they also quote that the lab tests for TB or for syphilis and also for the viral infections were unremarkable in all the groups. It was around this time that they collaborated with a prominent physician in their institute who suggested that at least some of these patients were showing a very high uh, reaction to the tuberculin skin test. That is when they started noticing the association with tuberculosis. So, the importance of collaboration comes in here. Then they published this small series. You see, the previous one had more than 100 patients, but this is only a small series at that point of time of only seven patients. But all these seven patients had a very strong association with tuberculosis. The Montu reaction was more than 20 millimeters. All of them had an abnormal chest radiograph. PCR of the vitreous samples were positive in five of the seven samples for uh, tuberculosis. Two of the seven were positive for a lymph node biopsy, and one of them even had a positive sputum evaluation. Thereafter, they went on to treat these patients with anti-TB drugs and corticosteroids, and the rest is history. So with this background, when we decide to start a uh, uveitis practice in a high volume setting, how do we uh, manage our case? The first part, of course, is building the service. Like Professor Zerut mentioned right in the beginning, you first need to get all the official approvals. You need to talk to your bosses, convince them that a uveitis practice is very much essential for your clinic or for the hospital. Then you connect with the other disciplines, the internists, the rheumatologists, pediatrician, pulmonologists, etc. Find the adequate lab support, and this may be challenging in a lot of places. Get the right biochemistry investigations. Make sure that the quality of those investigations is uh, up to the mark. Then immunology, microbiology, pathology, and of course, radiology. Sync your electronic medical records, knowing that most of us are now uh, using these electronic uh, medical records. Sync them with the uveitis practice. Start building your team. Y you may think that the team consists mainly of clinicians. No, the, big, the more important team probably consists of the optometrist, the outpatient nurse or counselor, and the trainees who uh, later join your uh, practice. So all of these together will actually uh, help in serving the patients. You, you can't do these things alone. And at some point of time, you have to consider adding fellow clinicians because uveitis is a chronic disease. And you know, at some point of time, you will definitely need to leave the practice for some other work or a holiday or a vacation. And you will need support from the fellow clinicians. Now, the other part of getting started is developing the protocols. And this consists of uh, 
building the pre-evaluation data sheet, which the patient needs to fill up about the systemic conditions, uh, et cetera. Preparing a uveitis data set, which includes a basic data set for all the uveitis patients and an extended data set for a specific type of uveitis. Develop uh, lab algorithms. Of course, uh, th this is beyond the scope of this talk, but this could include some essential tests and some tailored investigations depending on the, uh, on the clinical presentation. And also patient information sheets, which need to be distributed to the patients about the type of disease or the type of treatment that these patients are being given. Now, while there are this, you know, a ton of uh, wonderful literature on uh, uveitis, on, on the approach to uveitis, these are two papers by Professor Doug, Doug Jabs, which I recommend routinely to all my fellows uh, at, at our clinic. Uh, one is published in 2013 uh, in AJO, the approach to the diagnosis. And the other one, I think in 2017, uh, again in the AGO on immunosuppression in uveitis. I think these are wonderful uh, papers to get started with your understanding of uveitis. The data set part, uh, if you look at the publication from the Royal College uh, in UK, you will find a nice compilation of uh, the basic and the extended data sets that you should be collecting for all your patients of uveitis. Now, once you have set up your lab, you would want to begin your research. And again, in this, uh, there are two parts. One is the general part of uh, any research, and the other is the uveitis specific part. As I mentioned earlier, the, the limitations are not about resources of time, manpower, or funding. More often, the limitation is with the intent and that is what which we need to develop first before uh, we begin our research. The other thing is to find a very relevant research question, which applies to a lot of patients who are attending your clinic. You read up the literature, find the gaps in the literature, and also find questions which can explain some of the clinical observations that you have found in your clinic, which are otherwise unexplained by the available literature. The next part is to be very thorough with the documentation of history, clinical signs, uh, imaging, lab tests, and the complications. The collaboration, which, which can't be emphasized enough with other specialties in ophthalmology, in, in medicine, and also with the basic scientists. And finally, we have to learn the skills of uh, time management because we ultimately need to address uh, our patients as well and learn the skills of manuscript writing. Now, some points that are specific to uveitis are the importance of learning uveitis nomenclature, especially that comes from the sun classification system, the different classification systems of other types of uveitis, tuberculosis being an example here. And uh, also a basic understanding of immunology, molecular biology, and pathology when you get started with your research. Now, I would like to close with uh, a short glimpse of our journey in the pathogenesis of ocular TB. We mainly focused on two questions. The first one was to address the question of intraocular infection versus a remote infection in ocular TB. This is very commonly stated uh, in any discussion on ocular TB, but nobody really tried to uh, you know, look at what actually is happening in the pathogenesis of this condition. We also wanted to address the myth of hypersensitivity reaction, which again is very uh, commonly stated, but there is no real evidence of uh, any hypersensitivity reaction happening in, uh, in this condition. And our focus uh, was on the clinical phenotype of TB retinal vasculitis. The other area that we addressed was on the search for autoimmunity because like I mentioned in the earlier uh, discussion on, uh, on subpigenous like choroiditis, a large number of these patients would resolve with corticosteroids or immunosuppressive therapy alone. Of course, many of them would recur in the later stages 
but they did respond to such anti-inflammatory therapy. So we were thinking of uh, the possibility of autoimmunity and also the phenotypic similarities of many forms of ocular TB with the uveitis entities, you know, made us look for autoimmunity. So about the part on establishing the evidence of uh, infection in the eye, we followed what many other centers were also doing, uh, looking at the molecular diagnostics. We, we tried multi-target PCR. In fact, we still have one of the largest series on PCR proven ocular TB in, in the literature. We devised new forms of molecular diagnosis, such as the loop-mediated uh, uh, amplification, which, which uh, we reported, uh, I think, in 2012, and something called as a normalized quantitative PCR. We did a histopathological study of lesions like this from, from a non-enucleated eye, because most of the histological studies on ocular TB were from enucleated eyes, but we took a sample of retina from a detached uh, a patient with a retinal detachment. And we demonstrated that these lesions, which we thought as coronal granuloma, were actually intraretinal granuloma uh, lying inside the retina. We also stained them with uh, the immunostaining for HLA-DR, which is a uh, marker for macrophages. So thereafter, we did clinical studies where we have now predicted the, uh, we have demonstrated the clinical predictors for TB retinal vasculitis, such active retinitis lesions, as you see here, or the heel lesions. And we uh, you know, found a new sign, which we call as focal vascular tortuosity, which you, you can see uh, uh, in the fluorescein angiogram very clearly. Finally, we also demonstrated the uh, response to anti-TB therapy alone without the corticosteroids, at least in select cases of these TB retinal vasculitis, which really established the role of infection in the genesis of this condition. The other thing that we did was to uh, develop a zebrafish model of uh, ocular tuberculosis, where we injected the zebrafish embryo with the mycobacteria of a fish called as Mycobacterium marinum, and through live imaging uh, of fluorescent-tagged mycobacteria and fluorescent-tagged macrophages, we could demonstrate the crossing of the blood retinal barriers by the uh, macrophages and by the mycobacteria and the formation of granuloma inside the eye uh, during the mycobacterial infection. The other thing that we did was looking at uh, the in intraocular autoimmunity, and we demonstrated the uh, cytokine response to uh, retinal crude antigen, the RC that you see here is the cytokine response to retinal crude antigen and the ESAT-6, as some of you might know, is a TB antigen. So we demonstrated that there was a immune response to both TB antigens and retinal autoantigens in patients with ocular tuberculosis with the autoantigen-specific cells being more resistant to the uh, activation-induced cell death. I'm not going into the details here, but it's, in, it's interesting how we, you know, developed these kind of ideas. The, the idea of ESAT-6 actually came from a TB researcher in Berlin who uh, I had contacted several years ago. And, you know, during a general discussion, he just suggested that why don't you use ESAT-6 uh, to uh, look at the TB response in, in the eye. And the uh, idea of the retinal crude antigen came from a paper on birdshot courier retinopathy from Netherlands which actually had studied only two eyes where the retinal crude antigen was used to demonstrate uh, autoimmunity in the vitreous cells uh, in birdshot chorioretinopathy. So, you know, you just have to keep your horizons open and I I'm sure uh, these, these ideas will keep coming into your mind. Our current research is looking at compartmentalizing infection and autoimmunity in different types of uh, ocular tuberculosis. Uh, a, a quick word on education. I'm sure Dr. Uh, Professor Zerut is going to cover this in much detail in his presentation. But uh, education, as we now realize with you know what COVID, COVID has shown us, it can be both conventional education as well as virtual education, and both are equally important. Conventional education, as you know, it consists of residency programs, fellowships, observerships. It 
prepares the next generation of uh, of physicians to take over uh, the 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 clinical care of patients it helps in reaching out to relatively underserved areas in your population and also what i personally feel uh, is very critical is that you learn as much while you teach uh, others on a particular subject now virtual education for a long time used to be uh, mainly about webinars either by societies or by institutions but as we can see in this iusc webinar series that you can also have a very long term engagement with uh, a number of people through online education the uh, other example of this kind of a long term engagement is what we have been conducting for the past 7 months or so which we call as the lvpi uvitis course and you know this has taught us how much we can cover in uvitis training especially because it is not very well covered in usual residency programs and this does not match very well with the high prevalence of uh, uveitis in the community uh the uveitis in particular in comparison to other subspecialties offers us a very uh, wonderful way to teach which which you don't see in other specialties because uh of so the have, possibility sorry, of image based, to based to learning end. in uveitis there is compared to say retina or cornea there is relatively less requirement for hands on experiences in uveitis it also helps in inculcating this uveitis thinking process and uh, while uh, you know doing these long term programs and it, it's amazing how you can have such a large number of fellows online fellows if we are currently having more than 150 people who are following us uh, on a weekly basis uh, in in our online course and 30 uh, plus of these uh, registrations are from outside india so the scope is huge uh, and, and it's up to us how much we can uh, make use of this opportunity to summarize there is a great opportunity for academic uveitis in these high volume settings we have to find our problems and the solutions for our own problems nobody is going to do them for us and we don't have to bother about the resources it's the intent that really matters and that, that is what is needed for academic uveitis in our high volume settings thank you so much for your attention well thanks very much for this very nice presentation we're a little bit over time actually and i would like to invite john campen now to give his experience coming from university to africa means ethiopia john welcome thank you very much manfred let me just share my screen So um this is an unusual talk for me. Um I'm going to just sort of describe my experience in making a major transition from sort of a more traditional academic setting in the United States to starting um a a whole program in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So just a bit of background about myself. I trained in ophthalmology in the early 90s and then proceeded to um what was called public health ophthalmology program at Johns Hopkins got additional degrees about research mostly and um embarked on an academic medical career in 1998 and I initially started focusing on ocular complications of AIDS sort of thinking that was the disease of the century but that was just at the time that the antiretroviral therapy became available and the whole world um was changed you know may it happen so for diabetes and inflammatory diseases as well and so that rapidly became sort of mostly about presbyopia in that patient group as the um, underlying disease was controlled and focused then primarily on uveitis and ocular inflammation after that and 
pursued a career largely focusing on um, research funded by NIH grants. So I began at um, Johns Hopkins and was a faculty member there for seven years from 98 until 2005. And then I moved to Penn, which was where my wife's family was located and um, in Philadelphia and was there um, for 10 years, basically, and um, rose to full professor with tenure in 2013. And, and by God's grace was largely, you know, I think recognized as the main uveitis clinician in that area of about 10 to 20 million people and um, carrying out research in some NIH-funded studies like the SITE study and the MUST trial and the successor studies to that, as well as others. So, but then I shifted in 2015, so that was overlapping one year still under Penn to um, Ethiopia, which I'll tell you about, and then that led to needing to shift to uh, Mass Sinair and Harvard about a year later. So let me just talk about this change and how we went about it. So my main motivations to make this change were um, sort of my own personal Christian discipleship um, and my wife um, trying to follow Christ and make a difference in an area that needed development, even though it was costly. We also sort of from a more theoretical perspective wanted to try to establish proof of concept that a self-sustaining cross-subsidizing model as pioneered in India, like we just heard about from LV Prasad, um, could be workable in Africa. And that's sort of a larger ophthalmology picture, not just um, uveitis only. Um, we plan to establish a uveitis subspecialty practice in that area, which didn't, as far as we knew, have any specialists um, for about a billion people. And we plan to um, develop an academic center, so not just clinical services, but training and research, and so um, set out to develop clinical research capacity as well. So um, because of that, then, I had planned to continue as a clinician investigator and not just seeing patients, um, since being a clinician investigator is maybe my uh, best competency. And so because of that, I wanted to continue doing academic research and continue the grant programs at that time. Um, we're still working on the site to uh, mortality and several analysis grants about cataract and remission of uveitis, which are still sort of trickling out, um, as well as I, we still hadn't finished the primary must paper, um, which I finished in 2017 with my colleagues. and. Um, had several active grants, and so I needed to have a U.S. academic appointment with a um, department that would be willing to have me basically telecommute and live overseas. And so I thought that that would be possible, um, since in the United States, um, U.S. academic centers typically require us to raise our own support. Um, we basically have to raise the money ourselves through grants and clinical revenue, and so. I was about 80% from grants at 60 day, I guess, yeah, in general, that, that was the target was 80% from grants. And so then I transitioned from the clinical revenue to support from Site for Souls from many generous donors um, to carry out the work overseas. So it's um, about balanced between those two sources now. And Penn, the department was receptive, but the um, dean's office sort of eventually kind of let me know that they didn't want me doing that. So I eventually um, transitioned to Mass Ioneer that was more open to the model, and that's worked out quite well, really. Um, all right, so then just thinking about this and why we ended up choosing Ethiopia. so. At the time I was thinking this through, um, Ethiopia had and still has the, lar the second largest population in Africa after Nigeria, about 90 million at that time. Now it's about 115 million. And at the time they had about one ophthalmologist per three quarters of a million, which is actually not that unusual for Africa, unfortunately. 
and it's actually improved somewhat since then, maybe one per half million now. Um, the number of people undergoing cataract surgery was relatively low, um, even though the um, number of people with blindness was very high, especially taking into account the age of the population. There was a need for more training, although it was really more at the fellowship level, um, because there were five residency programs at that time. So actually, at the present time, I think one out of every four ophthalmologists is a resident. So there's kind of, you know, a lot of development going on, but it wasn't going as well at that time. Um, some of the programs really had very limited, I think one only had one faculty member for um, six residents per year. Um, others were pretty well staffed. And and there weren't any subspecialty fellowship programs, and so this was sort of a big opportunity. In fact, at that time, in all of Eastern Africa, there was only, I think, a retina program in Tanzania, I think was the only program in the whole region um, doing fellowship training. And um, Ethiopia also had the special interest in trachoma, which um, was um, an area I thought would be a good one for research and indeed has proven so. It's also a country that had um, development happening, at least in the main city, and so we thought that um, a cross-subsidization model would work, um, that there um, are people that can afford to pay, you know, 10 or $20 for a visit. Um, I think we're charging $8 now, and um, could pay for cataract surgery and then subsidize the poor that way along the Indian model. And it's an influential site and would be a good site for training um, with the African Union base there as a diplomatic center and as a very well-connected um, center by air um, to the rest of the world. At the time, it was said, or I guess it was in the 2015 um, Vision Loss Expert Group paper um, that we concluded that Ethiopia was the second um, worst in the world in terms of blindness um, after adjusting for age. Now, the, the population age is really young, so if you look at the absolute burden, um, it's less um, because the average person is 19 years old. But um, as the sort of demographic transition happens and more people um, are old, um, it should have a very high risk of blindness. It was something like 10 to 15 percent of people over 50 were blind. There weren't any uveitis practitioners that I'm aware of, except in South Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa at that time. Um, there were three retina specialists in Ethiopia at that time, and a few others in other parts of Eastern Africa. And there weren't any uveitis training programs that um, I know of, um, still um, other than ours um, at that time. I'm not sure if there might be one in South Africa, but I think they're training overseas. Um, and Manfred and Vishali and I and others um, did a course um, in the first um, COEXA, which is the College of Ophthalmology of Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa conference, I think in 2012, maybe. And there were a number of general ophthalmologists that I had come to respect um, that attended, and they were really kind of amazed at the concept that we could manage uveitis the way we do. And so really, um, there wasn't a very developed concept of managing uveitis other than just with eye drops. And um, the, from the clinical research perspective, um, there not, wasn't nothing going on, but um, there was room for growth. Um, actually, there's a precedent of everyone having to do a, a research project to graduate from residency. So, um, so then... Most care was occurring in a few public centers managed by residents with limited supervision. There had been some private practices established since about 2011, and um, some of them had OCT and photography, so that had been recently available in the community. Um, there were a substantial number of people able to pay for services and were paying these practices, which were successful. Um, and also, it was a situation where there were a large amount of regulatory obstacles for sort of foreign input into the health sector, and so this created a lot of difficulties for us. 
So how did we go about implementing the program? So I'm starting with the sort of whole program because there wasn't any department that was self-sustaining other than the private practices there and we were looking to do a not-for-profit model. So um, Site for Souls then was planning to start something and fund it and so Ethiopian regulations at that time didn't allow a foreign entity to start any healthcare organization other than an entire hospital. So we couldn't basically we couldn't do it ourselves. And charities, you know, in the US we would have like for instance Mass Ioneer is a charity and doesn't take profits. And so um we would like to have arranged it like that, but charities at that time weren't allowed to engage in cost recovery at all and be sustainable. So we had to solve that problem. Um, we wanted to set up an Addis Ababa because we wanted to do fellowship training and research. And um, so we needed to set up there. So we ultimately chose to come under a sort of leading mission hospital, which also has a medical school, which um, is registered as a for-profit company, but just never takes profits. And so that's what we did um, under this hospital called Myung Sung Christian Medical Center, now called MCM Comprehensive Subspecialty Hospital with its associated medical college. And then Site for Souls operates the eye department under that with a sort of fee splitting arrangement and cross subsidizes the poor, um, mostly with grants um, over the early years, but somewhat with um, surplus revenue, which is the long-term goal. So this is the site. Um, the um, eye department is right here in this um, large hospital building and the medical school is over here. And this is where I live right here, although at the moment I'm in Seattle. So since I was already a academic ophthalmologist um, with some papers to present, I began going in 2009 even to um, speak at meetings and get to know people. Um, we continued the site and the must funding from remotely. Um, this has been actually aided a lot by um, the COVID development since everybody is online now. I used some accrued sabbatical time to start the transition. Um, we started Site for Souls, myself and the colleagues I'll mention in a minute, and um, we approached various foundations that contributed to the development of this program, especially um, Himalayan Cataract Project at a more recent time and Mass Ioneer, but these were the ones that helped originally and, and the sort of host hospital in a way is the biggest contributor. This was the startup team. Um, Scott Lawrence is a glaucoma specialist from, he was at UNC Chapel Hill at the time we started. Dr. Demise Tedese is the um, regional advisor for Christoffel Blinden Mission for um, Eastern Africa as a well-known ophthalmologist in that area, and Dr. Emabet Gedehun was not really a young ophthalmologist, but about eight years out at that time, who was already working at the hospital, and she's the one that I ultimately trained as a uveitis specialist. So we had lots of challenges for the setup, um, transitioning Scott and my families, um, developing a sort of formal agreement with the hospital, developing space, hiring and training an initial um, team, obtaining equipment was quite a difficulty since we weren't well funded, um, continuing research programs and writing new grants and starting training programs. So going through that briefly, you know, I had to move my family. This was the most difficult aspect. Um, they not weren't always that happy about it. Um, but anyway, we're pretty well established in Ethiopia now. We had to refurbish space in the hospital. So they gave us some space in the main lobby of the hospital. And, you know, with the exam, we went through like 13 iterations of this. Um, but this was the plan with the optometrist over here with four meter lanes so that we could do research and then four um, ophthalmologist lanes and sites for ancillary equipment. Um, we got the help of the Lions Aravind Institute of Community Ophthalmology to train our staff. Um, these three and these three were our initial staff. So one, two optometrists, 
one, two, three, four nurses. Um, and um, she was a trained refractionist already before the concept of an optometrist had been established in Ethiopia. And you can see the four ophthalmologists here, as well as the LICO team. We obtained equipment initially by donation or by purchasing it with money we raised from Sight for Souls. And, and this was quite about a year long process to learn to go through the sort of compliance thing. Ethiopia has sort of a culture of regulation and compliance, which is not all unreasonable, but um, takes a lot of doing to work through things. And then the Himalayan Cataract Project offered to write a grant with us for equipment back in 2016. And so we did that together and it was awarded to Himalayan Cataract Project by a branch of the US Agency for International Development. And this gave us sort of good imaging and vitreoretinal surgery equipment, which took several years before it finally came. Um, but this enabled us to launch Retina about a year ago. And then um, I put in under Mass Signer another such grant, which has been awarded. And so we're still in the process of doing that, which was awarded back at the end of 2020. And so this should allow us to cover all subspecialties when we have that equipment. Um, our outpatient um, growth was quite, was pretty good, about 20% per year until 2020. This is calendar year 2020, so this is when COVID came, and we had quite a problem from this, as did the um, whole hospital with people being afraid to come. And um, so for about six months, this was reduced, and then after that, we recovered, and now we're sort of around um, 12 to 1,300 per month. And so since the beginning of 2021, then the clinic has been self-sustaining despite sort of you know, subsidizing the hospital as well. Um, you may have heard we had a civil war going on in the country, and that's pretty much resolved now. But by the end of last year, it was um, threatening the capital, and, you know, I had to move my family away. And so, but the Ethiopians didn't seem to be as concerned as the foreigners, and so really the clinic volume wasn't nearly affected as much as by COVID, and sort of... Um, that seems to be resolved now, thankfully. We started uveitis and glaucoma services with Dr. Lawrence um, from the beginning, basically, and then we've added vitreoretinal surgery in 2021, and we have a cornea specialist going for training next month, and hopefully we pick up um, pediatric ophthalmology and oculoplastics soon, and then we could apply for a residency program at that stage. Um, we had done a couple of fellowships. So Dr. Lawrence with Michigan and St. Paul's Millennium Medical College, one of the public centers, um, had trained Dr. Lemlem as a glaucoma specialist. This was also supported by Himalayan Cataract Project, and she did a lot of the training overseas. And so Dr. Lawrence has now left um, Ethiopia um, for various reasons, and so she's taken over his practice now. And then Dr. Emma Bate, um, one of our founding ophthalmologist I trained personally in uveitis, and so she's now fully trained since last summer, and I think is the first um, African, other than the South, white South Africans, the first to be trained in all of Sub-Saharan Africa in a full manner, doing immunosuppression and so on. So although we, we were aware of others who are, um, have clinics, which is good. So I continued the site in the MUST studies, as you probably know. Um, the um, FLAME trial is a new trial about trachoma that, um, by God's grace, was funded and is actually my largest grant ever. Um, and I've been participating in the Vision Loss Expert Group and some other studies. Um, we've gotten now four new grants since I came. So the FLAME trial is the biggest one three new site grants that are like analysis grants. And the advice trial also, you know, isn't my grant, but um, part of our group to do that, although I'm sort of becoming, you know, less involved in, in this group um, at this stage. I had, if you look at the trajectory of publications, you know, a big drop in the number of papers at first, since it was quite difficult to make this change, but then it's recovered largely now. So I had three of my four best years now since making this move and 
the number of citations has been increasing over time, although this isn't sort of adjusted for inflation, you know, because I think there's more and more papers cited all the time. So the FLAME trial is a, a big clinical trial um, going on, and, and so we've launched that um, this year after quite a bit of regulatory difficulties and COVID problems and so on, and that's going pretty well. Um, Dr. Ida Abishal is a key Ethiopian collaborator and Dr. Wandu Alamayu, and um, this is our study team. So getting to the uveitis then, you know, we had to build the platform as well as just seeing uveitis, but um, we began it from the beginning, and um, I haven't very aggressively pursued getting everyone to send all their patients to me because my goal is kind of development and not to just build my own practice. But um, we have seen about 510 distinct uveitis patients now as of about a month ago, and we have nearly completed the process of formal recognition of our fellowship program, um, and they we should be training two fellows at the same time um, before long. What I'm planning to do is have it be a part-time fellowship where people keep their position um, at, at one of the public hospitals and then works like two days a week with us when we have our uveitis clinic and then take one fellow every year. So they would spend two years working part-time with us and then overlapping one per year. Um, we now have um, very good imaging capacity with the Heidelberg system. And um, so we can do fluorescein ICG um, um, every, we have every Heidelberg option except for the anterior segment one. Um, we run the, or we're running this now jointly with Dr. Emma Bates. So whenever I get too old, um, she can continue with training this program and hopefully the other trainees as well. Um, the uveitis service in general would have grown faster, I think, had we aggressively promoted it, but we didn't want to um, like say that we were better than these um, other practices that were already successful because we're sort of about trying to help everyone succeed and not undercut anyone. Um, and we'll start publishing about this shortly. I have a medical student working with me, but she had to be evacuated because of the Civil War issue. Hopefully she'll be back in a couple of weeks and we can start describing this and how we have lots of tuberculosis, very similar to um, what's going on in India that we just heard about. So we look to train fellows for Ethiopia and then regionally, and then to start a program with support from Mass Ionir, um, Global Surgery Program and um, Himalayan Cataract Project to sort of have a formal curriculum at the five residency programs, which would be something new. Um, Manfred has and the IUSG have been kind enough to appoint me as one of the IUSG ambassadors to Africa. And so I'm looking to sort of start visiting other sites more as Dr. Emma Bate now can increasingly take care of um, this. And I'm also looking into some other concepts like if we can include uveitis and in rapid assessments of avoidable blindness, which sort of needs some practical way of doing that. So I have some sort of nascent research um, agenda toward that goal. As, to, as well as to evaluate the proportion of cataract blindness caused by uveitis in Africa, um, which probably is not trivial and tends to not be sort of attributed to uveitis rather than to cataract in sort of our vision loss expert group syntheses of data. So why would someone do such a thing? Um, so it's certainly not for money, but in terms of um, sort of need, um, it's maybe the last frontier for sort of scaling up uveitis to the world since there haven't really been proper uveitis, um, uveitis clinics or uh, training programs in sub-Saharan Africa, except in South Africa. And, you know, we're seeing that there are a lot of people who are going blind from uveitis and that it's very treatable. It's really just, as, I feel like it's even more successful and treatment than it was in Philadelphia because um, people really just need basic treatment. And um, we've been seeing hopefully one of the things we can publish in a year or so really rather good outcomes. I suspect that we'll see 
um, an average improvement, whereas like with sight and must, we were seeing more that they were stable over time because um, often the, the patients are, um, you know, just haven't been successfully treated or maybe were just treated with eye drops. And so there are some eyes that are just lost and we can't recover them. They're already tysical. Um, but the um, there seem to be great improvement and some sort of surprises in terms of the diseases we have. There are also just opportunities that I see arising as um, sort of the, I guess, ability to recognize what could be done in research is brought together with the local problems. And um, there's, you know, a need to develop local capacity that, that my Ethiopian colleagues are um, really very capable and just need to um, have opportunities, you know, and, and many of them have sort of just been grabbing every opportunity that they could come across to become like a really good cornea specialist or retina specialist, um, even though they didn't really have formal observers or formal fellowships with mentored surgery training, but just observerships, but many of them have become very good. So developing such capacity then is really the key to alleviating blindness from uveitis in this region because just, you know, one encounter with the uveitis patient won't really make the difference and the, the capacity needs to be developed to be permanently available. So what would have been easier um, had we, if we were doing it over? So one of the things would be to have good funding from the beginning, like we were really scratching to find equipment and didn't have any imaging other than sort of basic um, fundus photog photogra photography of the disc and macula. Um, it was sort of good for me that I had trained uveitis in the 90s, so I could sort of live in that scenario and, and do pretty well. If we had started in a public center, we would have had vast numbers of patients right away, but it wouldn't have been self-sustaining and patients mostly couldn't afford the treatment, although a charity perhaps could address that issue. Um, so like there would be more patients had we taken that approach, but we wanted to sort of do something permanent um, that could sustain itself. And if we had grafted onto an existing well-run center, um, it might have moved faster um, say one of the for-profit centers, which I might have considered doing if I was doing it over again, um, because it's not, I think, unethical for people to make profits. But um, we were hoping to have it be not for profit so that more patients could benefit from it over time. And part of our goal was to, you know, not just about uveitis, but about starting a, a whole clinic and academic program from along the Indian model. So thank you very much. And I guess we can answer any questions at the appropriate time. John, thanks so much. There's hardly any appropriate time left. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and we have to start with Stephen Jay, please. But all the questions, please put to question and answers. Steve? I agree. Thanks, Manfred. And thanks again for uh, Manfred and also IUSG and Dr. Gupta for the opportunity to uh, speak with all of you um, in various time zones. And uh, um, just to kind of bring some of these concepts um, together, uh, Dr. Zerhut and I, are you able to see my slides okay? Perfect. Okay. Sorry, I need to... I'm just turning off the timings. <clears throat> yeah, so bring, to bring some of these concepts together related to uh, bringing what we learn in the university to an emergency situation, uh, I'll be speaking to uh, these concepts related to uh, our experience uh, as a group with Ebola and also vision health system strengthening. I really appreciate all the comments of the other uh, speakers as we think about these important topics related to how do we deliver uveitis care, uh, provide research and education in multiple different types of settings. And so uh, first I won't go through all the names, but there's just so many people that we've been um, fortunate to work with, uh, both from a mentorship perspective, as well as others that we continue to mentor. And I really derive inspiration from individuals, uh, both within the IU IUSG, AUS, um, Dr. Jessica Shantley, who's at UCSF Proctor Foundation has done a tremendous amount of work and uh, Dr. Justine Smith and Nisha Chari and many, many others uh, in the United States. Uh, um, other countries, as well as West Africa uh, partners who, uh, without whom this work wouldn't have been uh, possible. 
And so we're all um, really in, an emerg in a public health emergency and we continue to be And the global impact of emerging infectious diseases is clear to all of us. Uh, we've seen the headlines and we continue to see the headlines to where we sometimes would just um, prefer to turn off the news uh, at times. Um, but some of these infectious disease again, affect different parts of the world. Uh, measles, we've seen both in the United States and uh, last year was uh, really recorded at high proportions. And, and we know about the different surges of COVID-19 um, that, have, that have occurred and continue to occur. Uh, but again, I'll, speaking, I'll be speaking more to Ebola, which has also continued to occur within West and Central Africa um, um, over the past uh, few years. And so really when we think about some of the fundamentals and the foundations of where this uh, started from, it really was, again, thinking back what we learned in the university and related to some of these infectious causes of uveitis. Uh, these are conditions that all of us are continuing to learn about and see in our clinical practice and some of the high volume clinics, again, that Dr. Basu uh, mentioned, as well as in private practice as well, whether it's syphilis, uh, tuberculosis, the devastating complications of herpetic um, uveitis syndromes, or toxoplasmosis that we know, again, is a leading cause of infectious um, blindness and infectious uveitis that many of us are studying, uh, as well as the arboviruses that can also lead to ocular complications. And so for all of us, again, we're understanding the, the balance between the systemic manifestations as well as the ophthalmic manifestations really is where it starts as we think about um, where, this, where this goes and how we can continue to uh, perform uh, clinical care and research and education in, in emergent um, settings as well. Uh, but what I'll focus on, are, are, are this story really revolves around individuals such as uh, this young girl, Aminata Kante. Uh, she's a young girl who we've had the opportunity to watch uh, grow up. She's an Ebola survivor and her story uh, was published in the media. And she was an individual who survived, again, life-threatening Ill illness from Ebola, but then developed uveitis. You can see her uh, posterior sneaky eye and a dense uh, cataractus lens. And her story uh, was documented as Ebola's legacy uh, that we see other children who can develop cataract um, as well. Recent Ebola outbreaks <clears throat> within West Africa and Central Africa included the, uh, the largest uh, Ebola outbreak in history in 2014 and 2016 in West Africa, predominantly within Guinea, Sierra Leone, and in Liberia. Uh, over 28,600 um, individuals were, were infected and nearly 13,000 individuals unfortunately lost their lives. And uh, the Democratic Republic of, uh, of Congo outbreaks uh, more recently in from 2017 to 2020 <coughs> uh, in different parts, including Northern uh, DRC, as well as Eastern um, DRC as well, as well as periodic outbreaks uh, related to viral persistence. Uh, but Ebola virus disease, when we think about um, where Ebola tends to affect is really a reflection um, often of, unfortunately, of fragile health systems. Uh, as I mentioned before, in these areas between West and Central Africa, there are a number of indices uh, that we'll see in public and are discussed in public health circles, including metrics such as infant mortality, under five uh, childhood mortality and life expectancy. And you can see that these indices lag uh, behind the world, uh, as well as other uh, more resource replete countries and also need to be addressed as we think about these settings uh, where many of us have worked, uh, Dr. Kempen, again, illustrating his experiences uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, there's another uh, development index called the Human Development Index that actually balances uh, health, education, and standard of living. You can see these indices uh, lag behind other countries within the world. And these are the systems uh, that are quite fragile and these, these infectious disease tend to affect um, uh, more severely. But it really became a global concern when uh, international um, healthcare workers were repatriated uh, to the United States, as well as other portions uh, of the world. Uh, first with Dr. Kent Brantley and Ms. Nancy Wrightbull, who were evacuated from Liberia to the United States, um, actually to Atlanta at, at Emory University. And Dr. Ian Crozier, uh, who was a critically ill healthcare worker who had a kidney as well as lung failure requiring critical care uh, measures with all of the infection prevention and control measures. And his story was uh, widely discussed uh, in the media and uh, where I'm uh, currently situated now, is Dr. Rick Saker was, uh, was hospitalized for Ebola and fortunately uh, survived. Uh, but in the context of Ebola survivorship, <clears throat> one of the Ebola survivors, uh, Dr. Crozier, developed an aggressive vision-threatening uh, ocular inflammatory process 
Uh, and I really sought the mentorship of a number of um, uveitis specialists uh, in, in really in his care. And he developed an acute hypertensive anterior uveitis, uh, progressing uh, to a scleritis uh, with a hypopian uh, intermediate uveitis, uh, eventually iris heterochromia. You can see his iris color change uh, within about a 10 to 14 day uh, period. It was quite dramatic and ultimately a, a unilateral uh, pan-uveitis. And unfortunately with a number of experimental um, actually with one experimental antiviral and a number of, of corticosteroid measures, including both, uh, both systemic as well as local corticosteroid injections, uh, he was able to recover uh, his vision and really a, a more of a, a, um, a sigh of relief than a, than a pat on the back. Um, but in this context, uh, we discovered that he had Ebola virus um, in his aqueous humor. And this was after um, his, uh, his bloodstream actually had cleared the Ebola virus. And this was fully 90 days after his uh, acute infection. You can see his, his uh, pretty dramatic um, iris heterochromia. And again, the, the concerns about um, aqueous humor and Ebola virus um, in the eye really extended not only to um, the patient, but also to other individuals in West Africa and other countries where uh, Ebola virus was, was uh, uh, being experienced. So this point, uh, again, thinking about, th thinking about this theme from moving from uveitis, sorry, from university to an emergent setting, um, Dr. Jessica Shanta, Dr. Brent Hayek, uh, and myself, along with Dr. Crozier himself, actually then traveled to Liberia to try to understand uh, this, this process uh, further. And we worked with Dr. John Fankhauser, uh, who was the lead clinician and really a hero um, in the outbreak response. He himself was responsible for the evacuation of a number of United States healthcare workers. And with Dr. John Fankhauser, we set up a mobile eye clinic, including a really portable slit lamp equipment, uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy, again, to try to understand the extent of this problem, looking at visual acuity and what it meant to individuals who had already suffered so much through um, devastating um, Ebola virus disease personally and often affecting their families as well. And through this experience, we, uh, we screened uh, nearly 100 Ebola survivors in a fairly short uh, period of time. Uh, we found that uveitis was evident in just over 20% of individuals, uh, six of whom had bilateral um, disease. And it turns out that vision was impaired in over 60% of eyes and actually met the WHO blindness uh, definition of 2,400 or worse in 40% of affected eyes. You can see some of the images here, including uh, the cratic precipitates, uh, posterior sneakii, uh, corvinal scarring, uh, certainly the potential for um, selection bias in this population, but these studies have uh, subsequently and also been subsequently or simultaneously evaluated by others, uh, including Dr. Paul Steptoe, also the NIH um, had a very, very nice uh, prospective study to understand this, um, this disease in Liberia as well. Uh, but since then, uh, again, uh, what does it mean to go from university to emergency? We've continued to uh, evaluate uh, this condition uh, with the various uh, degrees of freedom that I've alluded to, specifically related to the potential for Ebola virus persistence in our EVICT study. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of the details about deploying that research study in this setting. Uh, we've also looked at the impact of vision and mental health uh, within pediatric Ebola survivors in a pilot, and we continue to work with a number of institutions um, on this program. And uh, we've since been deployed with the World Health Organization Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network uh, to really partner with Congolese ophthalmologists and building capacity uh, in an outbreak setting to understand disease uh, in Central Africa, as well as ensuring that they have the tools and the training and the skill sets needed to continue to care for patients in the midst of these recurring outbreaks. And so I'd like to speak for a moment <clears throat> a bit to the EVIC study, which was the Ebola virus persistence in ocular tissues and fluid study, which was conducted in Sierra Leone. And again, in the context of no, the knowledge that Ebola virus may persist in the, in the eye after and during Ebola survivorship, the question was, for individuals who have uh, cataract, when could cataract be safely performed in Ebola survivors who had lost vision? The goals of which were to guide safe and vision restorative surgery for Ebola survivors based on, based on evidence. And so it was a fairly complex um, study to set up, but it certainly involved a pre-procedure evaluation with the in-country ophthalmologists, uh, laboratory investigations. You can see Dr. Crozier involved in the consent and counseling uh, process both with a group setting as well as individuals. 
as well as a, a setup uh, with a procedure room design that we, that we worked with infectious disease uh, physicians on uh, that required a personal protective equipment donning area, uh, a red zone where the procedure uh, were to be performed, again, with the concerns that, that we could potentially have Ebola virus exposure, and subsequently a doffing area or a transition zone uh, to ensure that we have adequate infection prevention and control precautions. And this is a prospective study, uh, again, approved through the IRB and with the local Ministry of Health. Uh, we have enrolled 50 uh, patients. Uh, all of these patients were young age within their 20s. And the median logmar visual acuity was three or about the hand motions uh, range. Again, meeting uh, criteria for WHO, uh, criteria for legal blindness. Uh, the majority of these individuals had visually significant cataract. There were other indications uh, that we also <clears throat> chosen to study. Uh, the mean time post-acute Ebola virus disease uh, ranged in the two phases of the, of the study between 18 months and up to 36 months or three years. So this was quite long after their, their acute um, infection. And of these 50 uh, patients, we assessed primarily aqueous humor specimens, uh, but 49, 49 aqueous humor and one vitreous specimen all tested negative for Ebola virus by RT-PCR with our partnering lab in Eastern Sierra Leone and Kenema. And we also performed pre-procedure and post-procedure conjunctival swab swabs that also tested negative uh, individuals. And we only did this in the first phase of the study. And the patients who, again, tested negative uh, for Ebola virus who had cataract and elected to proceed with cataract surgery underwent manual small incision cataract surgery with uh, a very talented in-country ophthalmologist, Dr. Mogus Tasham, at the time with um, infectious disease oversight. And fortunately, from an outcome standpoint, we were pleased with their overall outcomes that uh, the majority of individuals improved and in their visual acuities, improving from the a median of hand motions to around 2030 at the four month range. And we're continuing to follow um, these patients. And uh, interestingly, uh, our learnings and the protocols that we developed in West Africa were utilized uh, for our individual who had developed a cataract within the United States as well. And so protocols that we had developed and vetted uh, with the ID physicians who actually traveled with us to West Africa to work with our um, wonderful West African colleagues. Um, these protocols were again deployed at Emory um, to take care of our uh, patient in the United States as well, who achieved uh, excellent vision after cataract surgery with Dr. Joe Wells. So since then, we've gone on to, okay, I wanted to briefly mention um, a very nice study again, thinking about the pathogenesis of disease by Dr. Justine Smith and this uh, publication in, in Transitional vision, vision Science and Technology uh, assessed RPE cells and showed that, they're, that they, these cells were indeed permissive to infection uh, with Ebola virus and supported viral replication and eventually release of virus in high titer. And uh, really, I would encourage um, all of you to take a look at this manuscript, but it really looks at the virus RPE interactions uh, that immunologically may, may contribute to long-term persistence of Ebola virus. And this paper, um, in combination with some of our um, work from our other colleagues from US AMRID, which also showed that Ebola survivor uh, rhesus monkeys can also uh, develop Ebola virus persistence in their vitreous, actually led us to um, develop um, the study that's currently ongoing uh, to assess further the pathogenesis of uveitis and Ebola virus uh, survivors in Sierra Leone. Uh, this is a three-part study. Um, the first aim is to assess the, the prevalence of uveitis at long-term follow-up and risk factors for individuals who have survived Ebola who may develop uveitis. Uh, we're also looking at molecular diagnostics to evaluate uh, vitreous fluid for Ebola virus persistence, and in that context, um, looking at building capacity for rich retinal surgery. So I really appreciate Dr. Kempen's uh, comments on subspecialty care, as well with his experience in Ethiopia. And, and lastly, we're working with some of our immunology partners, as well as our partnering labs in Sierra Leone, to evaluate immunologic uh, T and B cell responses in Ebola survivors with uveitis um, as well. So what are some of the challenges that we've uh, confronted and how do we approach um, outbreak and emergency response for eye disease? Well, some of the challenges uh, Dr. Kempen alluded to, but these can include resource limitations uh, in regions where the outbreaks uh, may occur. Um, there's a opacity in some regions of infrastructure, equipment, and, and sometimes subspecialty training. Um, 
But really, these I think that these are areas that we can continue to address and 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 then really uh, dissect to figure out how do we address these, both from funding as well as uh, building capacity. And some of these approaches, again, can include infrastructural support and training uh, in centers where outbreaks are likely to occur. Uh, I think that the innovations that we have, both in telemedicine and artificial intelligence, uh, may play a role that we can think of uh, in the future. Um, certainly rapid response teams in coordination with public health authorities, with the WHO, uh, the CDC. Uh, we're currently working with the WHO, WHO uh, Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network um, that responds to some of these situations. And the more rigorous studies uh, certainly can require uh, more, more funding, um, as well as an additional uh, con you know, constructing the data platforms. But these are the perspective controlled natural history studies and certainly important to continue to partner with uh, larger organizations who uh, can conduct these studies over a longitudinal period of time as well. So moving forward more recently, we've uh, deployed with the, again, the GoARN or the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network um, to Eastern uh, DRC. And this was a very challenging uh, region to work in because within Eastern DRC, we have some of the, really the security instability uh, that we see um, in certain areas. Um, but uh, we really needed to go under WHO bridge with also security support uh, to work with the Congolese ophthalmologists. Uh, but we were able to conduct a symposium um, on eye disease and with Ebola, related to Ebola survivors, as well as provide care uh, for several hundred Ebola survivors in the context of, again, uh, strengthening educational platforms and building capacity, as well as thinking about opportunities for eye care and vision health strengthening uh, for DR Congo in the future. These are some images um, of our partnership. Uh, one of the nice things about ophthalmology is that these uh, skill sets are really quite modular. Um, you have the visual acuity station. We think about ocular vitals, uh, checking pressure and visual fields, uh, but also um, guiding um, ophthalmologists uh, through uh, finer aspects of the slit lamp examination, uh, portable fundus photography. You can see Dr. Crozier um, using his uh, fundus photography skill sets uh, with one of our a very talented local staff, and uh, Dr. Jean-Claude Mwanza, who is a really fantastic uh, ophthalmologist who has a dual appointment at the University of North Carolina, as well as the University of Kinshasa, uh, with one of, his, one of his colleagues, again, um, practicing indirect ophthalmoscopy and B-scan B ultrasonography, um, as seen here. And uh, again, through these stations, a number of the images of, of how we can think about providing care um, again, in settings while also partnering this um, with educational initiatives as well. One of the aspects that COVID-19 has taught us is that we really need to be um, flexible in terms of how do we think about um, global health. And so um, partnering with uh, MedShare, uh, which is a non-governmental organization who specializes in supply chain, uh, we've been able to support some of our Sierra Leone, Sierra Leonean colleagues with personal protective equipment, uh, we're continuing to partner with other institutions related to thinking about vision health and how it affects quality of life, as well as mental health. And as I mentioned previously, uh, understanding uh, eye disease and the pathogenesis of uveitis and Ebola survivors uh, with ongoing programs and really building hopefully retina subspecialty care and other subspecialty disciplines uh, in the future. Uh, moving forward. Um, we have a, a strong commitment to health access and security and a commitment to women and children, as well as, again, some of our strengths related to uh, research in technology and innovation leadership uh, in science and medicine through a West African Center of Excellence in Vision Care. And for anybody who's interested, I'd love to continue the conversation about how um, IUSG could uh, partner in some of these efforts um, that are ongoing and important aspects of human capital development uh, with gender equity and educational educational leadership really to address uh, these disparities. Uh, we were fortunate to have our first uh, I, ICO fellow, Dr. Harrison Williams at Emory, um, actually about a year and a half, uh, maybe even a little lo longer ago now uh, for medical retina and uveitis. And so it was really wonderful to have him uh, visit us um, there for several months as well. And so I'll just summarize uh, again by just emphasizing that infectious uveitis caused by Ebola and other emerging pathogens really continues to require our characterization of these phenotypes, uh, viral persistence, and ultimately immune response. And advancing uh, these programs uh, can be challenging, but really requires uh, strong partnerships, 
coordination with local ministries of health, uh, ophthalmologists, uh, all of us uh, on the call um, this uh, morning or afternoon, wherever in the world we um, happen to be, um, as well as local staff and engagement with the international scientific community. And ultimately, uh, vision health system strengthening is uh, really needed in the way forward as an entryway to both clinical care and understanding diseases that we'll all need to, under, to understand and treat in the future. And uh, thank you again, uh, Manfred, for the opportunity to speak with you um, this morning. What a pleasure. Thanks so much for the nice presentation. So let me summarize the webinar with my presentation. <clears throat> um, So let me actually inform you about the concepts which the ISG has for people who want to learn about uveitis. That depends, of course, of different uh, situations. You may be already an expert, you have the, or on the other side, you may have started with ophthalmology. A few words to uh, ISG. It's the International Uveitis Study Group, first years, was founded in 1978. It was just a meeting of friends. Discussion of case reports and new research publications was in the center of the meetings. I became a member in 1996 and have the great chance to be the president until the end of this year. So let's see what type of education we have. This starts with the highest degree. If you are really an expert, I think you should join the ISG and um, you will see education research. If you're specialized for uveitis, we have different courses, webinars, and so on. If you're a more general ophthalmologist, I will report about the patient support system, which is actually available for all general ophthalmologists. And even if you are not living in an ISG country of members of ISG, we start now the ambassador support system. And hopefully that also brings in some good information. So how can you become a member of ISG? There are multiple people during the webinar who have asked, oh, would like to become a member. Well, it's a group of experts. That means you should have five years of uveitis after residency as most of your work. You should have published 10 publications in peer reviewed journals, five as first author, all about uveitis, scleritis, something like that. And we have in the moment approximately 140 persons worldwide. So something which we offer for the members of the ISG, uh, but also, of course, for highly interested people, these are international symposia on, on, symposia on UVITIS, the ISO meetings. We have nine. Uh, I had a chance to join two of them, to prepare two of them, to organize two of them. The next one will be approximately begin of September in the Netherlands. So if you're interested in joining such a meeting, you're more than welcome, go to our website. Then a few years ago, we started to create another meeting, which is a little bit more clinical. We call it Inflammatio. It has been, particip it has been done in Chennai and Tel Aviv. Uh, in addition for our members, if you're really a member of the ISG, you get the peer reviewed journal, Ocular Immunology and Inflammation. Uh, for for granted, um, and actually something which helped me a lot also to understand uveitis and the needs of uveitis patients is to have been the president of the patient interest group for well quite a long time. So you know these big meetings they are probably fantastic if you want to meet friends if you want to exchange your own experience, then this is absolutely necessary to join us on such meetings. This is CON since 2008. Sophia Androudi here and Baram Bodagi from the IOIS here uh, in the SANI meeting in Greece. This, these meetings are absolutely necessary. Here you see the previous presidents of the ISG. Um, but when this is probably a little bit too strong because there are a lot of uh, uh, abstracts with case reports and so on. If you really want to start with uveitis, we would offer you uveitis courses. So in the, in the last 20 years, approximately, the idea started to have a strong uveitis program, let's say for six days at a beautiful spot, 
Why not going to Venice? Exceptional time point. Well, why not going to the carnival? If you can pay that and it was possible to pay that. And we started in 2007, the starting year of the first Venice course. And in 2019, we had already the seventh course, 21, of course, no course because of pandemic. Well, probably if you're aware of um, Venice, it's a beautiful spot in this world. Here's St. Marcus Place, and here this is our island. It's the uh, San Servolo Island, where we have the International University, where we also stay together for some good prizes. So this is payable for our course. This is the entrance of San Servolo, and here in these rooms we have our courses. These are the, um, the flyers we prepare for each one. Here are the costs. Uh, which includes also the rooms, actually, for participants. Um, this is the faculty, which gets exchanged more or less every second year, something like that. So it's, um, it's okay for ISG members to stay in the faculty for two years, but then we want to have some new ones. So you see, coming from Saturday to Friday, coming Friday, we have a full program. Only exception is... Tuesday afternoon, the end of Mardi Gras or Carnival, where we are going out to celebrate the Carnival. This is a certificate which everyone will get after the course. Well, after the course is free for everyone. We enjoy Venice, of course. Sometimes it's not only enjoying because sometimes you have Agua Alta and that needs some uh, special solutions like in this situation where the fun really stops very quickly. But coming back to fun, it's carnival. It's beautiful at that time, especially also in the evening. It's a very, very beautiful, romantic way to celebrate carnival. And I think this was always a nest since years. We have the, the right reaches that we have pictures without here without the masks, the whole group of Uvaitis people and here with masks. And this is also very nice. Here, Stephen Foster. Actually, this was my mask last time. Well, staying with Venice. An important point for Venice is that we give grants. This grants means we can select people, typically one from each country, no more, not two from one country, typically from Africa. And they get accommodation free. They can get a travel grant for 800 euros and they get a grant for personal costs for 30 euros per day, which I think is a wonderful support already. And here you see the grant winners, mostly here from Africa. There's Nick Jones here just on action. And here just in the evening, then we go to St. Marcus uh, place. And that's me in the group of the grant winners uh, which really came from different countries in Africa, but also from Kiribati. Probably have heard about this one. Kiribati is a group of islands of 3,000 kilometers south of Hawaii, uh, north of Fiji, and it exactly has one ophthalmologist. And it was a pleasure to invite that lady to us. And I had the pleasure on the other side to visit her uh, next half year later in a very poor community, and um, it's fascinating. Well, then we had John Campen with us. You've heard John Campen as lover of Africa, and why not bringing this Venice course to Africa? Why not to Addis? So we did the same thing. Things were much cheaper, fortunately, and we were able actually to have a course in Addis Abeba with filled rooms, a lot of fellows and residents, residency people, and here even our friends from Sudan, who will hardly have a, a easy time to, to leave the country. Um, here's a faculty, a little bit smaller than uh, for Venice, but the same program, exactly the same program. And uh, this is a picture here from uh, the Thursday rounds. On the Thursday, people should learn, sorry, should use what they have learned in the previous days. They get case reports and they should discuss these case reports in front of us. 
and we will try to to illustrate to make it possible to solve these sometimes really complicated p uh, cases some impressions from beautiful ethiopia uh, with again a certificate and finally we were able also to visit this amazing country which i think during the civil war it will not be possible here and you wouldn't believe in 2020, one of my last courses outside of Europe, outside of Germany, we had a second Venice course, this time in Africa, this time in Accra, in Ghana, and you see the faculty here with a whole bunch of Ghanaian uh, residents. Uh, this was a very, very important and great meeting. Well, if it's difficult to travel to groups, to doctors, and to give presentations. Why not visiting countries, small countries, which probably only have one or two or three doctors, and then to teach uveitis case by case. So that's what I did to achieve actually my travel, my traveling in my life. I think I've been to, uh, I've been to all of these countries definitely not only with the ISG, with bigger meetings, but only to visit probably one or two ophthalmologists to enthusiasm them for uveitis and to see a lot of various patients. So we talked about support of general ophthalmologists. I presented you uveitis courses, but then we have the patient support system. And for this one, which I highly can recommend, please join our uh, website. The patient support system consists of the following one. If you have a complex uveitis, but no uveitis specialist who can help you, you can submit this case to our website. And this will be submitted to a moderator, which changes every month. He will then consider the whole case report, if it's okay, if there's something missing, and then submit it to our official website. This is available for all UVITIS, UVITIS members, and they will send the feedback of this case to the moderator, and the moderator will give this to the support, to the first uh, doctor ophthalmologist who submitted that case. So this is free actually for all ophthalmologists. They only have to register, but this is worldwide possible. And in the moment we have approximately two to three cases. Uh, it would be nice if you can use that system. Again, go to our website. There's a patient presentation system you will find easily. And there's a whole description how you can interact with us. Webinars. Well, you're in, just in one of our webinars. We started in January 21. Today we have the 13th. We are planned 36. I think very nicely is that it's visible on demand. So even if you're not able to participate today, which is with different time tones, really a problem, you should be able to see what we planned, what uh, our speakers can tell you. And now you are getting a little bit more interested in uveitis and you want to become a uveitis expert. So why don't you want to join an ISG member with a grant? Please go back to our uh, web, website again and there you will see a list of education of all ISG members starting from A to Z country wise. And there all the members without emails, of course, will show exactly what grants fellowship they can cover um, when you bring the money with you of course yes this is necessary uh, if you're interested to visit paris to one of these people or to germany uh, please contact our secretary and we will definitely be able to help you so then we probably have a situation with countries where we do not have isg members of course 140 members only um, this needs a little bit more. And we started the system of ambassadors of uveitis. So if you have a look for this map, all the red, sorry, yellow countries have uh, ISG members. So they are able to cover more or less their country and probably also a little bit uh, the surroundings. But we also have ambassador countries. That means we have uh, people sitting, for example, in Colombia, taking care for central 
uh, America, even for the Caribbean, even for Ecuador and Peru. If you want to have more information of that one, please contact us. As you can see here, we still have a big need for West Africa. Stephen, that's your part. It would be lovely to have you as an ISG member and to make you to ambassador of that part. Uh, John already mentioned his part, which goes down from um, Ethiopia down to uh, nearly close to South Africa. So we have a lot of countries already covered. And this is a list of our ambassadors and that's growing. Even in Fiji Islands, this is the only eye clinic in Fiji Islands where I had a chance to give presentations. Uh, they are also joining this program. And let me end up with one recent project. Um, I think we need also challenges for IOSG members and something we want to do, we are just starting with that one, is working groups. The idea is uveitis is part of a systemic disease. That means we as uveitis specialists need the help of, for example, pulmonologists, of CNS persons. So we are looking for cooperation with interested scientists of these associated disorders, which original lymphoma and uh, toxoplasmosis will be the first one which start, Bechet's disease the next, but of course for tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, HIV infection, plus probably a few more, we definitely also need such working groups. So in conclusion, I try to show you the possibilities you have to join uveitis on the, well, on the step ladder, which you can choose. If you're really good already, you can really should become a member of the ISG. If you want to get specialized for uveitis, follow our courses. Hopefully in 2023, we'll have the next Venice course. Africa, we really don't know. We have now 36 webinars planned and uh, join the ISG member with a grant, any of our, our ISG members. For general ophthalmologists, we strongly support the patient support system, which also, of course, is a great education system for our ISG members because there are some rare things in to, to discuss. And for the non-ISG countries, we really would uh, love to see you in the ambassador support system. So with that, I want to end. I hope that this webinar was interesting for you, gave you some brilliant ideas, and I hope you have a lovely weekend. Well, before... Before I end that... Yeah, before I end that, please feel free to ask your questions and answers here under this point here. Um, well, it's just three o'clock, but actually um, in the program, you'll see that we have still uh, our panel. And let me quickly tell you what I plan with the panel. Probably it only will take a very few minutes. The panel starts extremely basic and I would like that everyone from the faculty listens to that one and comments when they feel they should give some kind of comment. So the question is, you start with an idea, uveitis. Uh, I think everyone told you, you can hardly become a really very, very rich person with uveitis, but it's a beautiful thing to help such people as a specialist. Is amazing. So your idea is there. You need education, of course. Uh, I think we all gave you some good examples where you get your education. Well, then in the next one, you need some kind of plan. Plan depends a lot where you come from. If you're coming from a high power country to an emergency situation, this is definitely easier probably than, for example, uh, the situation Sumyava Basu had where he left academic and went to a high volume clinic. There are different uh, situations. And Mark, I think is in the middle, very difficult, definitely the situation of John, but this is really very, very challenging. And I admire him really a lot about his plans and what he has done. So then if you wanna start, I think you have to clarify this with your bosses. If you want to do that in private practice, good luck. 
that's fine, but probably it may be a little bit easier to start in a academic situation in a hospital or something like that. What about starting with one day per week to make things easier, to develop things? Then you should find probably some people which are also as enthusiastic as you, some, let's call them co-workers. Yeah, it's, I think it's interesting to educate uveitis. So if you know already things, it's beautiful to teach uveitis to others. And I'm sure you'll find easily some residents, fellows or whatever, which really are a big help for you later on. Something especially I think Sumyava and Mark mentioned, you need contact persons. You need good labs, definitely after some time. And you need people like pediatrics. Very nice example, Mark, I completely agree. There are big, big differences. And even in Europe, there are big differences. This is amazing. You need pulmonologists. I can tell you pulmonologists still believe that tuberculosis is exclusively an uh, lung disease. So there's a lot of things not correct yet. And I think they need also some information from our side. So I hope our working groups are really going into such a direction. And of course, infectiologists. I think if you have a chance to have such people with you, uh, it's not a speciality in Germany, actually, but I see the situation in India and uh, in the US, and this is really very, very good. My friends, you want to comment a little bit to this one? Yeah, uh, if I may, I, I add a point on connecting with uh, other experts, especially those who do not understand ophthalmology or uveitis so well, and you gave the example of tuberculosis and bandulogy. Yeah. So it's, it's very important that you know we take up case examples and share with uh, our pulmonology friends and show how treatment with anti-TB drugs is making a difference in this patient. When you mm -hmm. see those live examples, they are convinced and they kind of become friends for life. So they're on, you know the right person to whom to refer your patients to once you have to deal with, uh, you know, uh, that's a treatment of tuberculosis. Same applies to any other, you know, rheumatology uh, or, uh, you know, dermatology, any of these uh, specialties. I think a nice way would be to contact such people and to give them some kind of presentations about a JIA and the eye, something like that one, which also refers not only that's a local problem, which is completely irrelevant and not true, but to show what has been done nowadays with good treatment, systemic treatment, something like that. Same with tuberculosis. Yes, I think this is very important and that creates a lot of trusting situations. Uh, maybe I'll make a need... comment on what you said earlier. Do you want to go first, John? You can go ahead. I just wanted to make a comment on what you said at the very beginning, Manfred, on starting small with one day uh, a week, for example. I think one of the things that Sumiava mentioned also was to have protocols. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, these can come from where you did your training, if you've been able to go for training. Um, and I think part of what you showed also, John, is what the approach is to uh, how to treat uveitis. And some of it is either in our head or written down. And one of the things I think uh, we could do with the IOSG is uh, to take some of these protocols and make them available through our website to sort of help people get started if they need to. Um, and uh, I think starting small and having good support, either from your own mentors and from local people, I think is an important way to, uh, to get started. Protocols yeah. means huh? treatment protocols? Treatment protocols, um, protocols. <clears throat> the type of support you need, um, you know, getting started, whether it's in, in a uh, private setting or in a, uh, in a hospital, is a daunting experience, and we all have some of that experience. And certainly when I started, even at the NIH, I read some of the articles that Steve Foster had written on how to screen for patients and others. And over the years, we've all developed our own approaches, and I think it sure. would be good to make it available. Mm-hmm. Good idea. John? Yeah, like the guidelines paper that was made back in 2000 is, you know, 20 years ago as well. So there could be yep. a, a good thing to do there. 
Um, I was going to say too, I think it's really important to, you know, go around to meetings and to, you know, talk about our concepts because people in developing countries and in every country are very busy with their practice. They're under pressure to produce revenue, um, whether for themselves or for their institution. And they don't really, you know, we need to kind of get their attention. So I think going around like what you've done, Manfred, and sort of presenting experience and so on, it really makes a difference. Like um, I mentioned the course that we did back in Rwanda, and I think, you know, that really made a difference. And if I, you know, unfortunately, we haven't been able to have conferences the last two years in Eastern Africa, but, you know, when you present like a case that, you know, no one knew what to do and they were getting worse for two years and then you realize it's tuberculosis and then the patient's cured, you know, the um, this sort of really opens people's eyes where you see like a VKH case, you know, yeah. that is a disaster and then you have another one that, you know, what the disease was recognized and you managed them and they're perfect, you know, these kinds so of I things. So I remember in Rwanda, we started easy <clears throat> to ask what is the dominant type of uveitis they didn't know yeah they were not even exactly. able to differentiate interior from posterior uveitis you know which is a simple basic and it's such a simple step to improve the situation of patients it's tremendous and but on the other side my teaching experience in africa is fantastic yeah i love to go to africa these people are amazing yes whatever they hear they keep in mind i'm absolutely surprised and it's a super pleasure for me to go back to africa hopefully we can do that together in some time yeah i mean actually the ones who are doing it in africa are um the ones who take every opportunity to learn whatever they can and so they're extremely receptive and yeah. um very sharp <laughs> amazing yes yeah Yes, yeah. yes. You know, I see, I've seen even people which had a grant from, uh, from Venice. I visited them in their country and they were simply entertaining the other doctors with what I wanted to tell. It's, it's fantastic. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah. So never give up. Yes. It's, our impact is dramatic. It's not good. It's in, dramatic. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I think so, we need I think we need to keep focusing on Africa too because it's really an unreached area for the most part, you know, beginning to yes. have some yeah. So one more word for people listening now from Africa. You know that we have different categories of ISG members. The full ISG member I presented. This will be probably a little bit of problem for you to publish 10 publications plus five under your own name but there are also associated members and if you would love to participate in that one please go back to our website check what's an associated member and probably you should try to contact us and if this is possible for us we definitely are interested to work even with an associate member Manfred, okay did you um could you navigate to the website where you submit the cases? Like I couldn't find it when I just looked just now, just for people who want to submit cases to IUSG. Oh, I don't know exactly. Mark, can you, can you do that? Ooh. Um, it's, it's called patient I support. Can... I think patient support system. Let me see. It's on the top line there. One sec. Yeah, you need to go to ask advice and you'll probably find it. Mm -hmm. Request oh, nice. patient presentation system. Yes, exactly. If, uh, I may share my screen here. This is oh, yes, how yes. it is. Ask you have advice. to click on ask advice and you find the patient presentation system and request uh, I use advice with the download template, yeah. Great. Yeah. Very good. 
again, I forgot to tell that if you're a submitting ophthalmologist, you have to download a template and to fill in the whole history of your, uh, of your patient. And probably one more point, this is free for you as a doctor and free for the patient. Okay, we do not ask for any money for this one. Okay, with this, I think I would like to tell you that was a pleasure with all of you. Very interesting topic, very unusual topic, necessary topic. Thanks for this suggestions, suggestion from to the person who did that. I forgot his name. And uh, I think we will meet again in the first Saturday in February, then with um, JIA Associated Uveitis. Thanks so much. Thank Could I shortly ask the faculty to check the questions if there's anything? How can we contact with Manfred Zero? Yeah, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay otherwise if you're done please enjoy your week and thanks so much and yeah, thanks everyone good to see everyone yeah take care bye everyone. bye 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 Okay, I think we selected all. John, nice to see you next time again. Okay. Okay, good to see you, Manfred. All right, I'll be in touch soon about the ambassador things. I'm just dealing with some issues yeah. with my family right now. So. Okay. <laughs> all right. Have a great day. You too, please. Best greetings to your family. Okay, thank you.